the wallaby, an Australian native hopping around our countryside. They might seem harmless, cute, maybe a bit cuddly, but that couldn't be further from the truth here in Aotearoa. They've lived here for over 100 years and their numbers are exploding. Here in Aotearoa, we love the Aussies visiting us, and especially with the rugby, and we love beating them, but uh, one thing we don't like are the wallaby. They can have a back. An unwelcome visitor from across the ditch causing huge problems. They're considered a pest because they can destroy productive farmland and native forests. And although mostly found in South Canterbury, they've been creeping closer to Aoraki Mount Cook National Park. Kia ora, I'm Tom Kitchen, and today on The Detail, are we failing to keep wallabies under control? We're testing out new technology. We're actually trialling night vision goggle assisted helicopter search and destroy. But are humans setting these efforts back? There's no point in spending you know, a lot of money trying to eliminate wallabies if some people then release animals again. With wallabies hopping closer to one of our most iconic national parks, have we got the tools to stop them? Wallabies are a cute animal and it's um, it's not their fault that they're here in, in New Zealand and a pest issue. That's Brent Glentworth from Environment Canterbury. He's been trying to deal with the wallaby problem for the last 30 years. But how did they get here in the first place? They were brought over in the 1800s, around 1872, and released at, at Mount Studham, down at, in, uh, behind the South Canterbury town of Waimati on the Hunter Hills. Yeah, it was mainly they were introduced as a, as a novelty animal and for a bit of sport. One of those keen on wallabies for a bit of sport was Sir George Grey, one of New Zealand's first governors, who released a few on Kawo Island. Early on back then, there were six species of wallaby released in New Zealand in various locations. Uh, the only wallaby species in the South Island is the Bennett's wallaby, um, came from Tasmania. And you can probably guess what happened next. They ended up escaping or being released. We're not too sure back then. They were doing um, very well in the high tussock country of South Canterbury. It wasn't until about 1950, so some 80 years later after the release, that they were first classed as a pest. And um, farmers back then were concerned about the burgeoning, the increase in wallaby, uh, the damage they were doing to pasture and defences, they have a high dietary overlap with stock, with sheep. So anything sheep will eat, wallaby love. Where they drop their feces, uh, stock won't eat around it. And um, so that displaces stock. Uh, they damage fences over time. So once we worked out 80 years after they were introduced that these cute furry animals were actually pests, authorities decided to take action. The Internal Affairs Department were the first uh, government department tasked with their control. They shot, I think it was 10,000 in a few years and never made a dent in that population. And um, then there's a number of different agencies involved uh, in the control. Um, the pest board started to form around 1960, so were the rabbit boards. Um, they also had a, um, you know, the, the boards down here also carried out wallaby control. The Forest Service was involved. But um, the real agency that really made a dent in them was a unique um, wallaby service delivery unit called the South Canterbury Wallaby Board. It was very successful. They did such a good job of getting on top of the wallaby that the problem became almost invisible. Their, their annual catch or um, kill rate for the last four years of their existence was between 1,800 to 2,200 wallaby per annum. This was in 1992. Back then, that was um, considered by Landcare Research to be matching recruitment. So they were keeping the wallaby population in check. So the wallaby board was doing its job in keeping the population under control. But in the early 90s, things changed. It was around the, that local government reform that actually started in 1989. And um, that board was funded by 50% taxpayer inputs, but also the landowners within the Wallaby area funded a communal rate. In the government reform, that um, subsidy from the taxpayer was coming off. So the landowners would have um, had an increase in, in that rate to fund that board. But because the Wallaby problem was so low and almost invisible, the landowners at that time said, look, we're not prepared to pay the rate. 
will take over the Wallaby control. So that was in 1992. The board was disbanded and the problem gradually increased um, over that you know, 30 odd years. With the Wallaby problem getting out of hand, a special containment area was set up. It covers 900,000 hectares, five times the size of Stewart Island. Bruce Warburton, a researcher at Benaki Whenua Land Care Research, explains. The councils that have these wallabies have a uh, containment area, and they have a containment area that sort of defines where the wallabies were, their core area, say, in the early 2000s. So if you know the area of South Canterbury, inland from Oamaru, and we have the Waitaki River, so that was the southern boundary of the containment area. And then through the lakes, Lake Aviemore, Benmore, um, up the Tekapo River to Lake Tekapo, um, and then through to the Rangitata. So that sort of defined a containment area. But the wallabies, because they built up in numbers, have leaked through that boundary, although it wasn't a hard boundary. So they're south of the Waitaki River now, and they've basically leaked, dispersed into the Otago area now. So the Otago Regional Council have to deal with wallabies now. They've leaked uh, west as well towards um, Aoraki, Mount Cook. So how did we reach this point? Once landowners took responsibility for controlling wallabies, it became clear they didn't really have the tools for the job. Here's Brent Glentworth again. The main control that landowners instigated was shooting. Second one, still there. And shooting is a very effective control tool for a number of pests, but it's got to be tailored to the right level of wallaby. So if you've got higher numbers, shooting is not an option. It creates more of an issue. So you've got to really bait them where they are in high numbers and then use shooting as a follow-up method. What happened is, like any animal that's um, exposed to a potentially lethal control, if they're not killed by that control, then they learn. So wallabies became a bit shyer. They would often move out of gullies um, when shooters started at the bottom, head over the top and spread because they they are such a mobile animal. So the problem ended up shifting. Landowners were going around in circles effectively and the wallaby population within that containment area rose reasonably uniformly, generally passively, but also um, they've had human assistance in some areas. So being taken out of those areas um, as pets and either escaped or released. So w- we really needed that um, some assistance to stop the spread of wallaby. And where's that assistance coming from? So there was a couple of business cases put to the government um, for an increased level of assistance with wallaby, but it wasn't until uh, July 2020 in that budget that um, the government announced uh, funding through MPI to combat that um, spread. The government's spending $1.1 billion, creating more than 11,000 jobs in pest and weed control. $27 million of that is to cull wallabies in the Bay of Plenty, Waikato, Canterbury and Otago. The increase in in funding through the National Programme has been a huge boon for increasing the effort and making some good results. When we first started control on one of our management units outside the containment area, say the south bank of the Waitaki, which um, up onto the Hawkton Range is our shared border with Otago Regional Council. When we first started controlling Wallaby there um, well before the national program, we were getting sort of um, one Wallaby every six hours of control. Now we're we're down to getting uh, the teams there are getting one Wallaby every 86 hours, so over two weeks of dog and gun work per animal. So they're down to those very low levels. And and that is a part of the issue is that um, it's very hard to find and control those individual wallaby. So they're spending more time out looking for wallabies, but shooting fewer of them. But this funding boost means they can start taking advantage of more new technologies. Thermal scopes and rifles. So the advent of thermal technology for um, pest control has been... um, really advantageous, uh, to, especially with those, you know, the warm-blooded animals in any of the mammals emit heat signature and um, it gives gives them away. So you don't have to use incandescent spotlights and, um, and things like that. So a lot of our contractors use 
thermal scopes, binoculars, um, pick up those signatures, and then they can actually sneak in and destroy those wallaby. We also deploy thermal cameras from um, drones occasionally. And we're also looking, uh, we've used them from the daytime from helicopters uh, to find uh, wallaby in those hiding areas or just outside of it. And we're actually trialing through the national program night vision goggle assisted helicopter search and destroy. So we're yet to fully realize how well that's going to work. But because it's a not, um, wallaby or a nocturnal animal, they're out of that daytime hiding cover and moving around and feeding and more visible. Um, flying a helicopter at night with a, the high-spec thermal camera that uh, one company has engaged for this work, um, we think it's got real benefit, but we're still trialling that methodology. It's got some very tight set criteria around it. Well, it sounds like a bit of a police helicopter for wallabies or something like that. Well, that's actually exactly what it is, Tom. And in, in terms of that um, technology, has been used extensively for crime fighting around the world and also for military. This is the first time it's been approved in New Zealand for pest control. Uh, we've done a proof of concept of this method, and we know that we can find wallaby with it, with flying at these tight um, go, no-go criteria, and we can dispatch them. But the main thing we need to work out is, is detection probability, so how efficient and effective this tool is, and that will guide where we can use it. Obviously, um, you know, there's still quite an onus on individual property owners, aren't there? So what do they have to do at, at the moment if they see a wallaby? How do they control it? So within the containment area, there's still a requirement that landowners manage their levels. And uh, some landowners are uh, handling that effectively, others not so. And um, the main gap is the coordination aspect between the landowners because um, I mentioned the mobility of the wallaby is such an issue your ability to go through a fence and the problem shifts is um, occurs quite easy. So the neighbours need to work together. And there's, you know, these guys are running a business, so there's a whole lot of other management requirements around, you know, stocking and and making sure they're um, returning a profit on their farm. But also pest control has to be brought into that. And if inside the containment area, they're in that some of that area that has very high numbers, they need to bait those high numbers using toxins or engage a contractor to do it for them and effectively reduce the population over a wider area rather than just pushing them off their land and pushing them around in a circle. Do you need more private property owners to do their fish? Yeah, it, it, there's some that do a really great job. There's some that uh, don't do much at all and most are in the middle that uh, do a reasonable job. With the government assistance or the taxpayers' assistance on this program, I feel that we can start to push Wallaby back but we do need other tools. Let's go back to Bruce Warburton from Manaki Fenua. He's looking at what else they might be able to put in the Wallaby Fighting Toolkit. MPI has a, a, a programme called Tipu Matoro. Um, it's the National Wallaby Eradication Programme. And as part of that, they're funding a range of research um, projects, try and get a better understanding on how to to detect them more effectively and how to control them more cost-effectively. So our research is sort of divided into components that are aligned with the objectives of the MPI's program. So one of their objectives is to eliminate outlying populations. And the challenge with outlying populations is that they are at low density and they're dispersed over large landscapes. So it's really, really challenging to try and find those animals. And then it's challenging to, to kill them because you may find them through their detection of their scats, their poos, but it might be hard to actually find the individuals to kill them. And then it's actually challenging to actually confirm that you've removed them all, that you've actually you know, eradicated or locally eliminated from a particular catchment. So some of the research that we're doing is, is trying to determine the detection probability of different detection methods. One method might be someone walking through an area with a dog, and dogs are very good at detecting a whole range of species, including wallabies. So if, if you work through an area with a dog or you fly over an area in a helicopter with a thermal camera and you don't detect anything... How confident can you be that there's nothing there or that 
you just haven't looked hard enough or your method's just not good enough at detecting an animal. So we're trying to measure what those probabilities are. And the best techniques at this stage seem to be dogs. But again, they have limitations because it's very hard to cover large areas with dogs and it's expensive. And there's, there's been some comment about the expense of some of this work outside the containment boundaries um, for the lack of wallabies that, that might be killed. And that's just the, the challenge of dealing with very, very low numbers. You have to spend a lot of money searching for these few individuals because there's no sort of magic way of detecting animals over uh, large landscapes. Uh, is finding wallabies like losing your keys, is it? It's a bit hard to get them. Yeah, well, the, the whole detection um, process is, is like losing your keys. So, for example, if, if, if say, you, you, you're going out to the garage to get in your car in the morning and you think, oh, where are my keys? And, and you think... Uh, they're likely to be in the kitchen, so you go into the kitchen and you have a look, but you don't see them there. So is that because they're not there or you just didn't look hard enough, they were just under a towel or you know, a tea towel or cup or whatever? And, and for me, I, I would go and do that and my wife would say, oh, here they are sitting on the bench, you just had a man's look. <laughs> so my, my wife's probability of detection for those keys was better than my probability of detection. So we have to know what those probabilities of detection are if we're searching for something and we don't find it. Okay. Because if we don't find it, we don't know it's not there or we just didn't look well enough or our detection method wasn't good enough. Any research into how to kill them? So there's several projects looking at um, different toxins. So the the two standard toxins that are used for the wallabies is, is 1080 baiting and cyanide, um, generally a ferrotox, which is a capsulated form of cyanide. Um, so we're doing some research on double tap. So it's a new poison. It's a sort of a synergistic um, model. There's other research looking at bait stations. So bait stations, the ones that are uh, commercially available, have been designed for possums. Some wallabies don't like putting their head into confined spaces, so we're looking at the behaviour of wallabies uh, around bait stations. In the North Island, uh, for controlling Dharma wallabies, there's a big challenge with using bait stations because possums dominate wallabies at bait stations. The, The best practice sort of... Um, belief at this stage, I guess, is that um, you have to get rid of the possums first before you can effectively control the wallabies. So that just increases the cost of doing a wallaby operation. So we're looking at bait station designs. Tied into that and the baiting, we're looking at different lures. So are there um, specific lures that wallabies are more attracted to than, than maybe other species? One of the challenging areas is that wallabies have spread and continue to sort of pop up in areas well outside their containment area and areas that they naturally would have dispersed to. So those animals and individuals or several individuals are believed to be illegal releases So that does occur. Mm. So there's some social science going on trying to understand why individuals like that might have those behaviours, why why they might be doing that and what might be done to try and minimise or mitigate that risk. Because there's no point in spending a lot of money trying to eliminate wallabies outside the containment area if some people then release animals into those um, areas again. As you heard at the start of the podcast, wallabies are inching closer towards Aoraki Mount Cook National Park. Here's Brent again, explaining the damage they could do to the environment. They will affect some of the biodiversity up there in terms of the plant communities, and that has flow-on effects to invertebrates and, and, and the other fauna that rely on that fauna species. A lot of the high alpine area of Mount Cook is not at risk of wallaby. 
because it's just too high. So we don't feel wallaby impact much over 2,000 metres in the altitude. Um, but there is those plant communities at the bottom that would be infected. For last year, we had uh, 39 kills. Um, but that, that was not in the National Park, I'm stressing. That's all around the bottom of Lake Pukaki area um, on the Ben Benohau Range and also the Gamak Range right through to the Castle um, areas. So we have contractors going through that area every few months, dogging likely habitat. And uh, we have follow-up shoots with helicopters when we have a snow event, a lot of that high country snow prone. So winter opportunity is a good time to fly the day after a snowfall and we can pick up the tracking of those animals, follow them and destroy them. So if these wallabies are getting closer to places like Mount Cook, I mean, we've got this big strategy in place with all this money, millions of dollars to build my total. Is it actually working if they're getting closer to and out of these containment areas? They're at the sort of edge of, of Araki Mount Cook National Park because that's where they got to before the program. So the program is now working to remove those outlying populations. So, so the first step is trying to clarify exactly where they are and then remove them. The challenge is trying to find them because they're not in high numbers and then trying to f remove all the individuals and then trying to confirm that you have actually removed all those individuals. So that's part of the ongoing program, and we won't know how successful that's been for a, a few years yet. Are you confident? Do you think they'll be eliminated? Do you think we'll get rid of them in New Zealand? Uh, I think we can eliminate local populations outside the containment area, to eliminate them or eradicate them from New Zealand, I don't think we have the affordable technology at this stage. We don't, we don't have the money to do that. So I think the sensible first step is to eliminate them from outside the containment area, get them back into that containment area where they were, say, 30 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, and then... Given the advances in our, any technologies around control and detection, shrink that containment, and that'll be over time. Okay. Um, and it, and it'll be, be it'll depend strongly on what funding is available. Do you think we actually want to eradicate them, or do you think we want to keep a few like Sir George Grey wanted back in the day? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a very good question, and that raises the whole issue of values. Some people just see these as pests that they should all be eradicated and that applies to a whole lot of in introduced species in New Zealand and there'll be some people in the community out there will will like them and that's the social aspect of these programs and it's important to understand what those differing values are. The program has to work with those multiple values and mitigate any risk. If the consensus is that we should eradicate, then any risk of someone trying to protect them and release them elsewhere, that risk has to be mitigated. That's it for today. I'm Tom Kitchen. The detail is supported by the Public Interest Journalism Fund. This episode was engineered by Phil Benge, our producers are Sarah Robson and Bonnie Harrison. Thanks to Brent Glentworth and Bruce Warburton. Kakiti Anna.